get started. Uh, thank you all for coming, and I'll turn the floor over. Thank you. <laughs> I think there was free food or something. <laughs> Welcome, and thank you for coming for this uh, very special time as college convocation. I want to uh, thank a few people for making this possible. First and foremost, Kyra Skinner, professor in the uh, Social and Social Sciences Department, director of the Center for International Relations and Politics. I want to thank also Amanda Kennard, uh, the Center's Administrative Director. Of course, thanks goes to the Heinz College for hosting this, uh, including Dean uh, Ryan Krishnan and Jackie Speedy, the Director of Student Affairs. I would also thank uh, the University Lecture Series and the Humanities Scholar, Humanity Scholars Program, both of which helped to co-sponsor the event. I'm going to acknowledge Dr. Tim Haggerty, Director of the Humanities Scholars Program. Thank you all for making this possible. Howard Dean was born in 1948. I was born in 1947. How come you look so much younger than I am? was raised in East Hampton on the eastern end of Long Island in New York City. After attending Yale, where he got a bachelor's degree, he received his medical training at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York City, where he met his wife, Judith Steinberg, with whom he opened a family medical practice in Vermont. Surprisingly, it wasn't health care reform that drew Dr. Dean into politics. Rather, it was more proposed condominium development on the shores of Lake Champlain. And indeed, throughout his public career, he's been a strong voice and advocate for managed growth and responsible land use planning. After serving two terms in Vermont's House of Representatives, Dr. Dean was elected lieutenant governor and then served six two-year two terms as governor of Vermont from 1991 to 2003 making him the second longest serving governor in the state's history. Despite being the only state in the union that does not constitutionally mandate a balanced budget, during Governor Dean's tenure, Vermont paid off much of its outstanding debt, balanced its budget 11 times, and lowered income taxes twice. I wish I could have done that here. <laughs> uh, governor Dean also focused his attention on health care issues resulting in a significant drop in the rate of uninsured in his state during his administration. I'd like to add a, a personal observation that, to me, I've always been impressed by the uh, great range of knowledge he's displayed on uh, public policy issues. I recall an earlier visit he made to our campus, and we were just chatting about this. When he came here to uh, uh, give a keynote address at a conference on cybersecurity, I think you were chairing the Information Technology Committee for the National Governance Association at that time. It was very impressive indeed, the knowledge he displayed about cybersecurity, which you would not, I didn't expect the sitting governor to know so much about. And I think he impressed very much the techies that were sitting in that audience. Finally characterized as a liberal, Governor Dean's record uh, defies easy categorization. While he was governor, he signed the nation's first civil unions legislation in the law. Uh, at the same time, he was also endorsed by the National Rifle Association several times during his tenure as governor. Governor Dean announced his candidacy for, candidacy for presidency in 2003. His platform emphasized health care and fiscal responsibility, as well as championing grassroots fundraising. His campaign was the first to simply use the internet, a strategy which, of course, was very rapidly copied by his opponents. It's become uh, a standard part of modern politics. Governor Dean founded the group Democracy for America in 2004 in order to use his internet-based organization to support like-minded candidates. He was appointed the chairman of the Democratic National Committee in 2005. Rather than concentrating on a few swing states, his so-called 50-state strategy was committed to winning elections at every level across the country, and is credited in part for the results of the 2006 election, which brought Democratic majorities to both the House and the Senate. 
After 30 years in politics, Governor Dean left public service in 2009. He's now a fre frequently seen commentator and contributor to CNBC, Financial News Network, and MSNBC. Please join me in welcoming back Governor Howard Dean. Thank you, Mr. President. It's got kind of a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Um, I, I'm going to uh, talk about the health of our nation, but it's not like going to be mostly about health care. But hopefully the majority of this hour is going to be yours uh, to com make comments and questions rather than my just give um, a lecture. Um, I will just say one thing, you know, that was a very nice bio. And there was only one little thing that was not right. I always make these corrections. I was actually not appointed as the DNC chair. If that was an appointed position, I never would have been appointed because nobody inside the Beltway wanted me. But fortunately, there are 477, 447 votes, and 350 of them are outside the Beltway. It was an election. Uh, much to the chagrin of all the Democratic insiders who didn't like the 50-state strategy or anything else that was good for them. <laughs> um, I, I want to. This is actually the first time I've ever given the talk that I'm about to give. Um, and so bear with me. It is not meant as a partisan talk, although I suspect that the partisan leanings of my own partisan leanings are shared by a lot of you. It's not meant as a partisan talk. If, when I give this talk, and I've given little pieces of it before, um, uh, Republicans react to it strongly. Is it, It's not meant to do that. It's meant to be thoughtful, and I want you to bear with me. The first thing I, before I get into this is, I'm talking about the long-term health of our country. I'm not talking about the short-term uh, economic downturn. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, the fact that we're in Iraq and Afghanistan. And you know, these things have come and gone. We're a very strong country. I'm not even talking about our economy. Um, there's a great. I, I served. Uh, I, I worked for a couple of years on Wall Street before I went to night school and got myself into medical school years ago. And there was a st saying then that I think is as true uh, today as it was then, is don't bet against the United States. Don't bet against the United States economy. It's an enormous, very uh, vibrant economy. So I want to start by saying that. But there are some very serious problems that we're facing that transcend the fights every day about how much we're going to spend or we're going to cut the deficit and all that kind of stuff that is, is mostly noise on cable television in, in Washington. And here's what I worry about um, a lot, and you should too. And there, it, this, you'll be happy to know this talk ends with good news, which is the news that you're going to be in charge of this country soon, and that's going to be a big improvement, because I think our generation is about done. Hillary Clinton uh, talked a few years ago, and was made fun of, of course, about, and some of you may remember this, a vast right-wing conspiracy. And she was only wrong in one way. It's not a conspiracy. When you do things in the open, there's nothing, you can't call it a conspiracy. But going back over, and I'm not, we're not talking about crackpots of the John Birch Society, people like that, although they seem to be in the ascendancy now. That's a relatively temporary phenomenon in the history of the country. I mean, that's gone on before. Father Coughlin, you may, some of you students of history, in the 1930s, uh, a, a, a priest who was actually, I think, kicked out of the church because he was embracing racist ideas and so forth in this very popular radio show, the Rush Limbaugh of his day. Um, the Know Nothings, an anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant group uh, before the Civil War who was crusading against immigrants that weren't uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants from Europe. So there's a long history of all these kinds of illnesses that we see today going back in our country a long way. If you have a democracy, and if you have a Jeffersonian democracy, you can't avoid populism. Andrew Jackson, the famous story about when he became inaugurated, and 20,000 people walked in their hobnailed boots through the White House and wrecked half the, uh, the carpets and so forth and so on. So those things you have to sort out uh, differently because those things come and go in cycles, and these things are coming and they'll go too, some of this talk. But this notion of the right wing 
desire to run things differently is threatened to the country. And it comes in a, in a couple of forms. The first that I worry about deeply is the concerted effort to put right-wing ideologues on the bench of the United States. We have today a Supreme Court which, in my opinion, is composed of four relatively moderate jurists, four right-wing ideologues, and one conservative, being Anthony Kennedy. That is deeply troubling. The two court cases, which in my opinion are two of the worst court cases in the very long history of the United States, and on par with the Dred Scott decision, uh, in fact, the Dred Scott decision was actually more based on constitutional law than the two court cases I'm about to mention, because in fact, in the Constitution, it did count African-American slaves as three-quarters of a white person. The two court cases that this court has decided, not, they're not the Roberts Court, but Rehnquist before him, were Bush versus Gore and Citizens United. Now, we're not talking about conservative versus liberal here. We're not talking about a case where the labor unions were decided that it couldn't have as much power or that uh, it wasn't as easy to vote as it should be. <coughs> We're not talking about an argument between Democrats and Republicans. We are talking about, for political purposes, undermining the Constitution of the United States. There is nowhere in the Constitution of the United States where it says a corporation is a person. That was an invented right that was invented by the Supreme Court of the United States. There is nowhere, in the, the embarrassment of Bush versus Gore, which is really actually a worse decision than Citizens United from a legal point of view, in my opinion, and I'm not a lawyer, so if there are some here, you're, let's have a debate about this. The embarrassment of Bush versus Gore was the last sentence of the decision said, this decision shall not be used as precedent in any future case. If you're a jurist and you put that in your decision, you are essentially saying, we are making this up for the purposes of this election. That is not the role of the Supreme Court of the United States. There is a mechanism, there was a mechanism in the Constitution to resolve the Bush versus Gore election. At the end of the day, Congress becomes the judge, and each delegation votes individually on who gets their votes. That's not what they did. They stopped, what they, remember what that court decision did, it stopped the votes from being counted from being recounted in Florida. So you had the highest court in the, in the United States of America, the leading democracy in the world, saying we are not going to count the votes anymore. That is a deeply disturbing precedent. And again, this is not about a court case about the death penalty or a court case about gun rights. Or, these, things will, these things change. They go back and forth. The courts are... Uh, uh, susceptible to some public opinion, hopefully not nearly as much as the other political branches are. This was a core undermining of the democratic process. I don't know what the motives were. Of course, we can all suspect, what, you know, but given the allegiances of the judges and how they got to power, the ones that made this decision. It was a five to four decision. When Richard Nixon's case about whether the tapes that were taken in the White House uh, during the Watergate era, went to the court. A group of nine justices who had been appointed by both Democrats and Republicans decided nine to nothing that those tapes had to be made public. Nine to nothing. There was no Democrat-Republican split on that court. This was a five to four decision. It showed a gross failure on the part of the Chief Justice because most chief justices heretofore don't make, heretofore had not made groundbreaking, enormous decisions of this magnitude with a five to four decision. And it showed a contempt for the law and more importantly, a contempt for the American voter, which is what I think the core issue is in this so quote unquote vast, ring, wing, rat, vast right wing capacity, uh, conspiracy. Not that the right wing is bad or the left wing is bad. I grew up in an era when the left wing was as awful as the right wing is today. They were burning up down buildings. They were, I mean, their cause may have been a cause that I was sympathetic with. We shouldn't be in Vietnam. They were doing appalling things that they had no business doing, just as the right uh, is doing today. But is a, what, those two court cases are incredibly dangerous because it means the equation of the, the, the refusal to continue with the vote recount so that we could actually know what the voters really wanted is a core attack on democracy 
the core value of this incredible country that we're in. And the notion that free speech is not only uh, is not only epitomized by money and equivalent to money, that is so therefore the implication is the more money you have, the more free speech you get. That's bad enough. The idea that corporations suddenly inherited the rights of individuals who vote and pay taxes in the United States of America, and they are now classified as people with all the inalienable rights of, uh, uh, under the Declaration of Independence that people had, is an attack on the very values that America was founded on 235 years ago. So these were two, so this, this federal judiciary has been poisoned in many ways by things like the Federalist Society. The Federalist Society was not put together as a, uh, a social club for the betterment of justices and, and jurists. It was put together as an antidote to they, what they felt was a liberal bias on the part of the relatively elite lawyers who ended up in the Supreme Court and in the federal bench. The problem is, unlike the American Bar Association and the other nonpartisan bar uh, and lawyers or legal um, organizations, there was a political bent to this. And it got to be when you went before the president to get yourself appointed to the bench, if it was a Republican president, you'd better be a member of the Federalist Society. Is a very dangerous precedent. That is a long-term problem for the United States. That transcends the arguments that we see today uh, in Washington about whether the Tea Party is going to cut the budget and where they're going to uh, cut it. The second problem is the degradation of our news media. Now, I think there may be a, a solution to some of these things, but it's a serious problem. And we'll start with Fox, because that's the easy one. <laughs> there's a difference between Fox and MSNBC. They're both biased. The New York Times is biased. The Wall Street Journal is biased. The, North, the New York Post is biased. The newspapers have bias. The Pittsburgh Post is certainly biased. Or is it the Tribune? I've forgotten which one is the right, which one's the right wing paper here. Okay. But, but they're both biased. You can't pick up any paper without the personal opinions of the, uh, of the reporter, whether it's on the left or the right, getting into the article. It's true. I, go read the New York Times. You can do this with, I, I think the New York Times agrees with me most of the time, so I, of course, th think they're great, right? But if you read this, whatever the story is, there's, I'm sure there's some political story on the front page of the New York Times today. In the, by the third or fourth paragraph, the, the uh, reporter is ushering in their own opinion. Bias is not the problem. It's something that makes us mad, but it's not the problem. It's when you become a propaganda outlet. What Fox News is not, says is often not true, and they know it's not true, and they say it anyway. It is not a news organization. It is a very expensive, incredibly well-funded, right-wing propaganda organization. The definition of propaganda is you take something with a small kernel of truth to it, you add, you twist, and you make it into a story. The death panels is a perfect example. The death panels, you remember the phrase? Let me tell you about the death panels that were in the health care bill. In the Congress before George Bush left office that was a Republican Congress, Charles Grassley, the senator from Iowa, was the chairman of the Senate Health Education and Welfare Committee. There was a call for a Medicare uh, overhaul and needed, some things needed to be reauthorized. In that, pan, in that Medicare overhaul, Charles Grassley had inserted into the bill something that said that seniors should get end-of-life counseling because a lot of money was being spent at the end of life and, and in many cases seniors were not being afforded the opportunity to make life-ending choices. I'm not, we're not talking about terminating your life or euthanasia, but the idea was that you should give seniors more control over something that's incredibly important to us, which is not just what your life is like at the beginning and the middle, but what it's like at the end. So this was something that was bipartisan, everybody supported, it's a sensible thing to do. You should be able to, you should pay this, the internist or the primary care provider for sitting down and speaking to the senior patient about end of life issues. It was passed, nobody said anything about it. When the health care bill was being written, now under Democratic management, 
the committee that was drafting the health care bill took the language from Charles Grassley and put it in their bill because they thought end-of-life counseling was a good idea and that should be in the health care reform. It shouldn't just be available to people on Medicare. It should be available to everybody. That became the death panel. It was written by a Republican senator chairing when he shared his committee. It was a smart idea. The vast majority of Americans believe it's a good idea that seniors and their doctors should be encouraged to talk about end-of-life issues. And I forgive Sarah Palin for doing this. I mean, I don't think she's going to be president of the United States and politicians can say things and anybody can say anything they want. But I don't forgive a supposed news organization who put that out every single day knowing it was a lie. There was a really interesting poll at the end of uh, the Bush era, towards the end of the Bush era, the second Bush era, that showed that 65% of people who watched Fox believed that Saddam Hussein had something to do with Al-Qaeda's attack on the World Trade Centers. 13% of NPR viewers, uh, listeners believed that. The President of the United States, George Walker Bush, was asked whether that was true or not, and he said no. Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with the attack on the World Trade Centers. The reason that 65% of the people who viewed Fox and got their news from Fox believed that was not because they were dumb, it because they were lied to every single day on virtually every program on Fox News. I think we've crossed a line here that has redefined the media. And it's not just Fox. I pick on Fox because they're the best funded and because they have a clear mission. I mean, when the this is, not, this is another thing that Fox has done, which I've never seen done before. They gave a million dollars to the, Demo the Republican Governors Association. How can you pretend to be a news organization while you're funding a political party? So it's a different way. We haven't done this before. It does happen in Europe. Political parties have their own newspapers. People choose to read them. They, and in this country, people who listen to Fox aren't all... Uh, no Republican stalwarts. They like, listen to Fox because they prefer to be angry at the left, just like we listen to NBC, MSNBC, because we like what they're telling us. The truth is the facts on MSNBC are true. And when they're not true, I mean, you, you may not like the spin, you may not like the kind of nasty, smarmy stuff that, that people say about other people. They're not nice, I'm saying. I'm on, I go on those shows sometimes. They're usually nice to me, but... They go on because I'm not nice to the Republicans. But if they make a mistake and they get the facts wrong, they correct it the next day. So that's number one problem. That's not the biggest problem. The fact that we have a propaganda outlet that most people think is a news outlet. The biggest problem is the corporatization of the American news media. And that can't be fixed, and it's not going to be fixed. And here's what the problem is. I am not a conspiracy theorist. I do not believe that corporations call up the news, that General Electric used to call up Brian Williams and say, you can't run that story today because this is our product that blew up in the desert and killed six people, and you know we can't have that story. I don't think they do that. Maybe they do it once in a huge while, and I, I think most of the time they try it, it doesn't work. The newsman says, I really can't work for you under those circumstances, and I'm not going to. Why is it dangerous to have a corporatized news media? Because the news has become a profit center. And because if it doesn't make money, then it gets cut back. So when I was growing up, there were three news channels, ABC, NBC, and uh, CBS. They had the three most respected people in America giving the news, Howard K. Smith, John Chancellor, and Walter Cronkite. And they all lost money. That's what they all had in common. Those three things. They all lost money. CBS didn't care. They had the biggest show. They used that show and Walter Cronkite to lead into The Price is Right. They made a hell of a lot of money advertising on The Price is Right and whatever came before the CBS News. Today, General Electric doesn't care. I'm not picking on General Electric. I think General Electric is a great company. But General Electric or Viacom or Disney, which owns ABC, they don't care about the news media or Brian Williams or whoever, Katie Couric, they want to know if you made money. And if you didn't make money, you're going to get fired if you're the anchor because your news isn't exciting enough. And your staff's going to have the hell cut out of it until you show a profit. 
Two things happen as a result. One is you don't get the kind of coverage you need. That is, they can't have 20 correspondents all over the world. Maybe they get cut down and they can only have five. And so they start making compromises. And you start not, getting, not hearing about things that you probably should be hearing about. And they cut and they cut and they cut until they can make money. There's another thing that's worse. This is what they say about local news, and you'll probably, I'm sure this has got to be as true in Pittsburgh as it is true in every place else I've been. If it bleeds, it leads. There is a ghoulish part of human psyche, including in all of us, even though we're educated university people, we like to believe this isn't true. I can show you lots of polling data to show that it is true. It's, there is a ghoulish side in all of us that we're, we kind of want to hear these horrible things, maybe to remind us that it's somebody else and it's not happening to us, whatever the reason is. It's why gossip has a, has a market even among well-educated people. It is the lowest common denominator. The great thing about Walter Cronkite and John Count, uh, Chancellor and all those folks is they had an eat, eat your peas mentality. John Edwards' love child would never got on the networks because it wasn't essential to understanding how to defend the United States or how to balance the budget or where, where the cru crucial decision points were about who was deciding what in the state capitol or in Washington or in a foreign country. It would never have gotten on the evening news. It leads now, why? Because it excites our prurient interest. So the news has debased itself and cut its back its ability to do even the little decent job that it does. Now, are these, I, I happen to like Brian Williams as a person. We love Katie Kirk, that's who we happen to watch because I think her tone is more uplifting and she's likely to have a more balanced approach to things. But these programs are shadows of their former selves, and I think the American people are not being well served by a media that seeks the lowest common denominator because it's entirely profit-based. So that is, that is the, that's a core institution. Look, I'm, I'm a professional media hater, right? I'm a politician. I never got a break from the media. The scream speech, right? They dress it all up. <laughs> Anybody in the room at the scream speech? Anybody was in Iowa at the scream speech? Nobody here? Okay. Well, it was very different. It didn't quite sound the way it did by the time Fox got done with it. <clears throat> so I have every reason to, to dislike them, and, and I can tell you great fun horror stories, and maybe in the Q&A period I will. But the truth is, the, the media, without a media, we can't have a free country. The media is what makes this country work in the sense that it stops politicians from becoming clep uh, uh, crooks. Uh, everybody thinks all politicians are crooks. Believe me, 90% of them actually aren't at all and probably never done anything that is thoroughly dishonest. Why is that? Because a fair number of them know if they do, it'll get on the front page of the local paper and they'll be in trouble. The media is an essential institution for the strength of a democracy and our media is very, very weak. And it is an enormous long-term problem for the country. Finally, and in some ways this is the biggest problem of all, capitalism is headed for failure in this country. And the reason capitalism is headed for failure in this country is because the capitalists are killing capitalism. What most people in the business, in business world have understood for a long time is that regulation is essential for capitalism. Too much regulation does stifle jobs. I don't quarrel with that. But having no regulation, which is the aim of the far right, essentially is like playing football without a referee at all. People get hurt, and exactly the phenomenon that's now happening in this country begins to happen, which is that the 80% of average wage earners have seen no increase in their wages here for 20 years in this country. This is not all George Bush's fault. This is both Democrats and Republicans' fault. It was Bill Clinton that signed the abolition of the Glass-Steagall Act which allowed the banks to do what they did to help get us into this terrible mess we're in. This is a bipartisan problem that we have been so influenced with the help, of course, of the Supreme Court and things like Citizens United by the business community that they are doing things that are against their own interest. Eighty percent of the American people have not seen an increase in their purchasing power for 20 years. The entire amount of growth in the economy of the United States of America has occurred in the top 20% of wage earners. 
The top 1% of Americans owns twice as much of a percent, as a percentage of America than they did 20 years ago. And that, of course, has to come from somebody else. And it comes from the people who aren't in the top 1%. Now, do I say this as a left-wing socialist? And by the way, that's another little meat lie that the Fox people tell of it. If they knew what a socialist was, which I have every reason to suspect they might, they certainly wouldn't call Obama a socialist. Do I say this because I'm a Marxist? No, I'm actually a capitalist. I served on some time on Wall Street. I believe in the investing in the stock market and these kinds of things. I hate to see capitalists kill themselves, and that's what they're doing. Because when, this is a sociological fact, not a theoretical wish. When the gap between those at the top, the top 20% and the bottom 20% gets too big, society gets unstable. And that you can go, look, go back and look that up for the last 2,000 years. In order to make capitalism work, everybody has to believe it benefits them. Or if it doesn't benefit them, it's somehow their fault which means you have to have a very small percentage of the population that isn't directly benefited by it. Oddly enough, and this is, this is, what, this is what the short-sightedness of the Koch brothers and Governor Walker in Wisconsin is, it's just so dumb. I can understand having a fight with unions and complaining about unions. I can't try to figure out how you want, why you'd want to get rid of them. The most prosperous time in America, other than the last couple of years of Bill Clinton, and that was really pop prosperous for the top 20%, but not a lot of other people, was in the 50s, when the unions were their most powerful. And in this town, you could leave high school with a high school education, maybe not even, and get yourself a job in the steel mill, and your kids could go to college. And while the Ford family might have a palatial estate on the, lake of lake, on the, on the shores of Lake Michigan, the guys that worked in the plant could still rent a little cottage for a couple of weeks a year and take their kids there. And they th that was fine with them. I think those robber barons like the Koch brothers who are putting all this money into changing America, they don't understand. Working people aren't envious of the Koch brothers. All they want is to make sure the system is fair. This is not about everybody has the same amount of money. The average person in a labor union doesn't want what the Koch brothers have. They just want to make sure that if they work hard, they get a fair deal. And that is being badly eroded. It's not just being eroded in terms of the numbers I gave you. The average American is beginning to believe that the system doesn't work for him anymore. That is a very dangerous place for America to be headed, and it needs to be changed. And it doesn't necessarily need to be changed by going back to the way the old Democrats used to do it, with a lot of too much spending and a lot of mindless regulation. But we have got to get rid of this notion that it's us against them either from the rich folks like the Koch brothers who think that uh, for whatever reason they're entitled to have everything they want and spend as much money as they can to victimize others, or from the kind of the old left wing of the labor movement who thought that everybody who had money was evil. We are all in this together. And the people that have risen to the top in the Republican Party right now either are afraid to confront what they know is true, which is that those folks are extremist and shouldn't be allowed to push this kind of policy in their party, or they believe it. They believe that somehow they are entitled to something that nobody else is entitled to by virtue of the fact that they have a lot of money, which they, I might add, they inherited. So this isn't about who works harder than who. It's not about rich people being bad. It's about balance and fairness in a society in a place where everybody feels that if they work hard, they can prosper. That is the core of the American dream, and for the first time, I think, in our history, the American dream is in trouble. It's been in trouble before, but it's been cyclical, and we've learned from it. The Gilded Age, the great before, right before the Great Depression, was a time, but we learned from that. And now we have worker protections, many of them because we had a strong labor movement. Can you make the case that labor movements did cause sclerosis to the economy? Yes, you certainly can. Too many work rules, those kinds of things? Yes, you can make those cases, but those things are best solve the negotiating table and not by taking away rights of working people that have helped to balance the system when it was badly out of balance when we hit the Depression. So I want to, what I want to leave you with, however, is the good news. The good news is there's a new generation here that has, is changing everything. 
I talked to a lot of gay and lesbian groups because, as the president said, I was the first person ever to sign a civil unions bill in this country. And they're usually in despair because of don't ask, don't tell, and discrimination, and votes like the one in California which, for Proposition 8, which undid their right to marry after they had it. And I said, why? Let's look at the slightly longer term here. When George Bush, who was obviously, uh, who, or arguably the most conservative president we've had since Calvin Coolidge, came into the White House, there was one state in the country with marriage equality, which was mine. When he left the White House, there were nine. Why is that? You had this conservative, and for six of those eight years that President Bush was in office, the House and the Senate and the White House were all controlled by the Republicans, the conservative party. How could this be? Because change doesn't come from the top, it comes from the ground up. It's what you do at the local level and what you believe in your personal lives and how you act on that change in your personal life that ultimately makes the difference. And if you don't believe me, look what happened in Tahrir Square not so long ago. This generation is an extraordinary generation with values that are in some ways similar to ours, but in many other ways not. The first thing about it is you are not tolerant. You are inclusive. The Republicans actually have figured out that they have a problem that this, because I actually do have friends that are Republican because they were operatives against me and now they're our friends because we're all retired and you know we can sit around telling <laughs> war stories. But they know they have a big problem. Because in your generation, you know, my generation and my end of the spectrum was very pro-civil rights and we all did what we could and so forth and so on. And things changed a lot, a whole lot. But we didn't grow up with people who were different than we were. We grew up in our own silos, and we happened to work with each other, but not necessarily live with each other. Today, people in your generation, everybody has friends of different races, ethnicities, uh, uh, languages, and ethnic backgrounds, and sexual orientation, and you all date each other. So, <laughs> you can't be a gay bashing party, you can't be an immigrant bashing party, you can't be a Muslim bashing party and get anybody who votes who's under the age of 35 years old because you're whacking their friends. Your generation is more conservative fiscally, certainly, than the left wing of the Democratic Party. Much more conservative, particularly after what you've been through trying to get a job when you graduate from even a place like Carnegie Mellon, and not so easy. My daughter just graduated from one of the best law schools in America, and she had a hard time. She wanted to be a public defender, and it took her a long time to get a job that she wouldn't have taken such a long time getting had it been five years ago. So it is much tougher. They could get you on fiscally conservative grounds, but they're never going to get you as long as they're bashing your friends. So they got to get through that. Secondly, your generation essentially doesn't really care much about politics. I don't mean in a bad way, you're not indifferent. You elected Barack Obama. People who elected Barack Obama were under 35 years old. The first election in my lifetime where more people under 35 voted than who were over 35. Never happened in my lifetime before. You elected Barack Obama. Why? Because he looks like you. He's multicultural. So is your generation, the first multicultural generation in the history of the United States of America. We've been a multicultural country for a long time, but this is a multicultural generation. But I'm not sure that that's the kind of thing we might have done. You know, we, we believe that we're going to change the system. I don't think a lot of you care about changing the system. You liked Obama because he was your generation's president. But my experience with your generation is when you want to change something, you just go on the net and find a hundred other people just like you, and then you put together a project and you do it. And you don't go to City Hall and you don't petition the Congress of the United States. You just do it. When I was, um, not very long ago actually, charter schools were a creation of the right. Charter schools were created originally to maintain segregation in the South to avoid the anti-discrimination uh, stuff that was coming out of the courts, and then to attack the teachers' unions. Today, charter schools are mainstream, started by people your age, who've gone to places like Teach for America and are making a, beginning to make a huge difference in the inner cities. Why? Because people like you have adopted them. And it has nothing to do with, in fact, I actually do a little work for a charter school that's run by the United Federation of Teachers in East New York. We don't care what the ideology is. You just want these kids to have an education and stop talking about it for 40 years and do something about it. That's what your generation is. All right, thank you. We appreciate the ideology. We appreciate the talk. Now, why don't let's get down to work.
So that's a big plus. Secondly, the free market actually does work, and guess what? It works in information as well. So if you don't want to believe all that horse manure on cable, television, or Fox, guess what? You just go on the net and you get your news from the net. By the time, oh gosh, it's going to be so soon now, I don't know exactly when, there won't be any television anymore because you're just going to hook up your modem, put the big widescreen computer, you'll have 20,000 football games and whatever you can see uh, or anything else you want to see. And the, I don't know how these television stations, people are going to stay in business anymore because why would you bother? I mean, you can just get it on your computer and that'll be the evening news. Or you won't bother with any news, you'll just follow the blog. Now, the problem with the blogs, of course, is even more misinformation on there than there is on Fox, and that's saying something. So, you know, the, the liberal arts educators, and I was, um, you know, victimized by them, too, um, you know, always used to tell us in social studies class that we we're not trying to tell you what to think, we're trying to teach you how to think. Well, now we're going to find out if that works or not, because you're going to be exposed to every kind of nonsense that you have seen, and they can imagine, on the Internet, and you're going to have to decide based on what you know and what makes sense in your own, because of your own education, both ex in school and experientially, what you want to believe or not. So it's, I, I don't know how this story is going to come out, but I know that that's the antidote to the degradation of the media. So people ask me all the time, should we have term limits? You know, these horrible politicians in Washington, I say I'm absolutely against term limits, but I'll settle for a constitutional amendment that prevents anybody over 50 from serving in the United States Senate. And that will <laughs> fix all the problems. So the good news is your generation is going to do it differently. The only thing I would leave you with is this. No change ever got made without persistence. There is no such thing as, and this happens all the time, and I think there's a little of this in your generation because it's a human trait. You elect Barack Obama and you say, great, now he's going to fix everything. We can go back to doing whatever we were doing before. You can't do that. You have to be in politics every single day. And I don't mean, you know, I know a bunch of you, I'm sure, slept on floors for 20 weeks for Obama. I don't mean that kind of politics, although, of course, I encourage that. I mean, politics is what you do in your own community to make things better. If you're organizing a school uh, or you're uh, painting houses in Mississippi, that's politics. It's community organizing is what politics is. You always have to do some of that. Pretty soon, if some of you have already started, you're, you're going to be out of here, you're going to have families, you're going to have jobs. You, you know, it's hard when you have responsibilities to take time for, quote, politics. You have to do it. It's the price of living in a democracy. And if you're not willing to pay the price, someday you're going to wake up and there's not going to be a democracy. I used to think that democracy was the highest evolutionary form of government, and therefore when we got there, we could worry about somebody else's democracy. You have to worry about your own democracy. And there have been some things in this country that have been extraordinarily disturbing that are threatening that democracy. And it's up to you to make sure that it gets passed on, not just from us to you, but from you to your own kids. Thanks very much. Two pieces of advice. First of all, make sure Obama gets reelected because he's, I like very much his two Supreme Court justices, and if he gets a chance to put two or three more on there, we might actually have a court that believes in the law and read the Constitution a time or two. Um, secondly, um, local action. Uh, New York City actually is going to have a, an attempt to put on their ballot a tuning up of their public financing of campaigns. Arizona, not exactly a flaming liberal state, has a pretty good campaign finance reform st uh, statute. And this is an interesting story because it shows you this is not, this stuff is not necessarily partisan. It, it, some Republicans think campaign financing is bad for ideological reasons. In Arizona, the legislature, there's a one you have to understand, there's a party that's more important than Republicans or Democrats in every legislature in Congress. It's called the incumbent party. And they don't want to get unelected no matter who they are. And they often, in California, for example, one of the huge problems they have is 
the Republicans and the Democrats get together and draw the district line. So last year, out of the entire California Assembly, there was one district that was in play, one. One. The Republicans say, yeah, we don't mind being a minority. We like it being here. And the Democrats said, who are we to argue? And they cut their districts up so that nobody could. I mean, that's, this is, does not serve democracy. For, and, so what you can do is go to this. I hate referendum government because it's used to take people's rights away, which is wrong. But it was originally intended to make sure that the legislature didn't run roughshod off the public. So use referendum in Arizona. The public, after they're getting disgusted with their legislature, put on the ballot a fairly decent law until the Supreme Court started nibbling it away at it, which basically creates a financing, a public financing system that both the current governor, who's a Republican, and the previous governor, who was a Democrat, won under and won their primaries under. They did it by referendum. The legislature tried to get it off the ballot. The unions and the Chamber of Commerce both put money into getting rid of it because, of course, they're both special interest groups. And they lost. So there's a lot of hope for local action. If you can't do it at the statewide level because you in one of the eastern states, which is less likely to have a referendum of government, you can often do it uh, just for your city or for your town. I'm a huge fan of what I call instant runoff voting. Some people call it ranked voting and so forth. Why? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, of course, you, you don't get the spectacle of somebody winning with 42% of the vote when 68% voted against that person. But it also, something that nobody understands, it, it makes the campaigns much more civil. They use it in San Francisco, and I went out there to help somebody because they had helped me in my presidential campaign, and I discovered that people at the top of the ticket were giving fundraisers for their opponents at the bottom. Of course, in San Francisco, there's 18 people running for a city council seat, and several of whom had, well, we won't get into that. But anyway, it was San Francisco, and it was a very interesting political culture. Um, but nobody was saying anything bad about each other. And when they did, it was about issues disagreements, not, you know, so-and-so is a socialist and all this crap. And why was that? Because they needed the second place vote. So if you and I are running against each other and I'm trashing you in the ads, guess who your voters aren't going to vote for under any circumstances? It civilizes campaigns and focuses them back on the issues and away from personal stuff. So there's a lot of reforms like that, and I, I truly believe the Congress will never pass that stuff, because neither side will want to try to give up any advantage but it'll be done piece by piece, and like Social Security, which actually started in the, in, the, in the Depression, the real Depression started in 1926 in rural states, in 1929 when Wall Street collapsed. And in the late 20s, Social Security came in in places like in the Midwest because old people were starving. And eventually Roosevelt put it in and became a federal program. I think if you did campaign finance reform piece by piece, locally, city, city by city, uh, you would eventually create uh, an atmosphere where enough people had to, who represented you in Washington would have to vote for it would get done. But then, of course, you needed a Supreme Court that actually wanted to follow the law. Uh, yes. Yeah, you talked uh, a lot about problems with the uh, news media in the United States, and I was wondering if you thought, did you really talk about any concrete solutions there? Do you think the UK has a system with a state sponsored media in the form of the BBC? And also, have you thought about how uh, that's not really going to matter anymore because I don't read the New York Times, I don't watch any news on TV, I just watch stuff on YouTube of what actually happens. Well, see, that may be the antidote. I mean, look, look we're not going to, we have a strong First Amendment, and I think we should have a First Amendment. I, I think, much as I, 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 I think, you know, the Fox groups and Murdoch's people are bad for democracy and they should know better, but I don't quibble with their right to say whatever they want. I don't think you're going to have a truth commission because one person's truth is another's political inconvenience. Uh, so I, I think one of the great things about our country is the extraordinary, and it is, our, we are an outlier. Even the European, there, you know, you can go to jail for saying there was no such thing as the Holocaust in Germany, and people do go to jail for saying that. Um, and I understand why they have that law given their history, but that would not happen here. The libel laws in Britain, you know, if, if you say something terrible about somebody, they'll always try to sue you in Britain because you really can pay a penalty for saying something that's not so and libelous. Can't do that here. It's almost impossible to win a libel suit in the United States. So we are very broad free speech. I mean, the right to lie to the, your, through your teeth if you have enough money to get it out there is an established right in the United States Constitution. <laughs> it's, it, it's the First Amendment. Um, and it's important. It does maintain our democracy because you don't want people like me threatening to sue you as a reporter for writing stuff that I don't happen to like. It, it does, okay? So the antidote is not to limit what they can say. The antidote is to, do exa is to have this incredible uh, instrument of democracy at your fingertips, which is the net, so that you can avoid them altogether and pay no attention to them and, and do a, a search to your own 
in your own mind, which will allow you to uh, figure out what the what your version of the truth is, and what makes the most sense. Do I think we should have a state-sponsored media? No, I think the BBC is actually terrific. The BBC maintains and has, and Murdoch is actually a huge opponent of this too, independence from the government. Murdoch has gone more than once to the conservatives after he's tried to get them in and tried to get them to put the hammer down on the BBC, and it's usually resisted. We have NPR, and I, I know the conservatives think it's all liberal bias and all that, and maybe it is, but. It, it does actually a very good job, and so does educational television, although most of their stuff is not uh, current events oriented, except for McNeil, Lair, and so forth. Um, so I, I think those models are fine. I don't think you're ever going to have a state media. I don't think we should have a state media, because uh, I don't think there's a government version of the truth. And, and when you have that, you have to enforce the independence, and then you get people like Congress who wants to pull, pull your funding if they don't agree with you. Uh, and I think the best antidote is actually the one that your generation has discovered which is so much access to your own ability to find out what you want that it makes the, the organized media meaningless. And I think they deserve to be meaningless right about now. And maybe they'll mend their ways and put on a program that actually benefits the country. Yes. Thank you, Governor, for coming. Run for president is such a rare experience. What did your run for president you know, teach you about yourself or the country? Um, well, uh, mostly good things. Um, it, it taught me some things I don't like about the media very much. But, um, but I, I will say this about running for president. Gary Hart once told me that no wimp ever became president of the United States. And that is true. Uh, you just, you, I mean, you know, you go, go through everything. People say the most outrageous things. They print the most outrageous. I've had reporters threaten to write stories claiming I engaged in insider trading unless I gave them this information. You know, just outrageous stuff. But on the other hand, you know, you complain about that, then how are you going to stand up to Vladimir Putin or Ahmadinejad, right? So I don't think it's so bad that this is a really tough, not very pleasant process to go through. I mean, this is the largest nation on the face of the earth in terms of our, our economy and our military power. And if you're going to be the person who's in charge of that, you'd better be tough. So, I, you know, I don't think it's all that bad. I mean, it's horrible, and you, most normal people would never submit to it. People kept asking me, are you going to run again? I said, you know, the first time you do this, you don't know what you're getting into, and it's forgivable. The second time, you had really better have a session, A, with your wife, and B, with your psychiatrist. <laughs> because, you, you know, you know what's coming, and you've got to think twice about this. But it's, it's, it is not, I mean, from an existential human point of view, it's a terrible process and all that. But from... To get to what you need to have being the president of the United States, not such a bad thing to put everybody through hell. Because if they can't stand up to a campaign, you know, you think the New York Times reporter is a jerk for asking you stuff that's not so or putting in the paper. Where do you see Putin and Ahmadinejad? That's the, that's a real problem. Yes. So given what we've been saying about the media, where does education come in? Because all that information access is great, but if we lack the critical thinking capabilities, it's useless. So. What do you see coming from your charter school or other stuff to make sure we don't just push toward math and science about how to think creatively and articulate that stuff? Well, that's a really interesting, that's an incredibly complex question. I'm trying going to try not to take the rest of the time up there, trying to. So um, you have to have a balance. Uh, you can't just do everything with standardized tests for two reasons. First of all, you can't measure creative thinking with standardized tests. And secondly, the great, the extraordinary thing about schools is the hit or miss quality of schools in the sense that's a downside to it, but it's also an upside. Great teachers are really turned on by what they teach, even if it may be quote unquote irrelevant to everyday experience. You're not, most of you, far enough away from your school experience, maybe some of you are, because I mean, you're in an institution like this. I can still remember professors that I had when I was in college or even high schools saying things that have stuck with me for 40 years. Some of them had nothing to do with what I do with my life every day, but it was their passion and their love for what they were doing that made me remember it forever. And that's a life lesson. So you don't want to extinguish that. We do have to have standardized tests. You, I mean, you don't, I don't care what the, you do in the wealthy suburban schools. Everybody's going to do fine there. But I do care what happens in the inner city schools, because we have done a crappy job for 40 years after the Civil Rights Movement. Things have not gotten a whole lot better in a lot of those schools. So you've got to have standardized tests. You've got to know what 9 times 9 does when you get out of school, is when you get out of school. And that's true whether you're in Montana or Mississippi or, or Pittsburgh. If you don't know that, you're probably not going to be able to make a living. And, and we have an obligation to get people out of schools who know things like that. 
But then you, you don't want to have so much of that that that's all there is. A lot of the problem is principles. School leadership in the building makes a big difference. And we drive principles into the ground. They spend half their work on politics, or at least in, in my state, running around all these different meetings all the time, and they can't lead. There's, there's enormous numbers of problems in education. I, I think the best thing to do, frankly, is to have different models appropriate to the different community and have measurable standards that everybody's expected to achieve. And we actually are making some progress towards this. But don't, and, and get out of the, it's all the teach school, that's another big thing. This is maybe the most important thing I'm gonna say. The most important thing about schools is not what happens in the schools, it's what happens before anybody ever gets to school. We don't do anything for zero to three kids. Head Start's wonderful, it doesn't start until you're three. The 20% the of kids who really are in trouble are kids who come from family backgrounds that they never had a chance before they got to school. The single moms who were on, have drug problems, the abusive people, boyfriends in the rural areas where you know nobody. If we don't start investing money in zero to three, I, I actually did a lot of this when I was governor, not because of education, but because our prison system was filling up. Our prison system is full of kids who never had a chance. They decided that they, they, school wasn't for them by the time they were in the third grade. They didn't sit and say, oh, I can't wait till I get out of here. They just had signed out. They knew it wasn't for them. That's our fault. That's not the school systems or the teachers union's fault. We not, as a society, we don't invest in zero to three. And if we do, do start investing in zero to three and start supporting families and make it easier for them to raise kids, that's going to make a big difference. So there's a lot of things we need to fundamentally change. I think the zero to three stuff is just as important as what goes on in the schools. And I do believe that there are, in, there are um, exciting, hardworking people in every single community in the country that can be empowered uh, with the right tools and support to do better in their school systems. We have to be more flexible about it. There's not a one-size-fits-all model for every, every one of the however many tens of millions of kids we have in our school system. But we, we need standardization, but we also need creativity. We can't snuff out creativity just for the sake of the standardized test, but we do have to have accountability, and we haven't had a lot of that. And mostly we have to be accountable as a society and stop pretending the school system can fix all the problems that, we, that are caused outside the school system. We have to invest early on. There's gonna be some time where we're gonna have to do two generations at not just one. That is, if a 13-year-old has a baby, they both need help, not just the baby. And until we're willing to help them both, that baby is never going to have the opportunities. I don't know how many of you know anything about the Harlem Children's Zone, Jeffrey Canada, but you ought to read a book by a guy named Paul Tuff, who was a reporter for the New York Times. I think it's called what it Take, Whatever It Takes or something like that. It's an incredible, he didn't get it all right. He's one of the early innovators and there's plenty of things that, mistakes he made and so forth. Uh, but he has really proved that with real emphasis on early childhood and support, the deal is you come with us when you have that baby and we don't care what your circumstances are, stick with us, do we say, we'll guarantee your kid goes to college. That's the, sort of the compact that we ought to make, but it's not just the school system that can do it, we gotta have a social system that supports it. It's very inexpensive to do it, by the way. Zero to three costs nothing compared to what it costs to put somebody in prison for a year. Yes. Um, following up on your... I think this is the last one. The president is about to get... This is the last one, so make it a good one. <laughs> Again, kind of tagging off the 24-hour news uh, questions that you've gotten, a lot of your answers seem to have been focused on the younger generation saying, you know, they'll, we'll make it better. We have better access to uh, news outlets and internet outlets and better information. But what about the older generation that's already listening to all this? Like, how do we get them to listen to more intelligent programming, for example, like Diane Reed, without having her sink to this sensationalistic level, you know, really, I guess. Uh, look, the older people are who they are, uh, and they're not gonna change. Um, so, look, the good news is the people who elected Obama last time were under 35. This time they're gonna be under 39. Next time it's under 43. After that, it's under, you get the idea here? I mean, the Tea Party, it's not a coincidence the Tea Party is all over 55 and white, right? This is the shrinking minority, ever shrinking. And the sh shrinkerier they get, the madder they get, which is why they've gotten so off the deep end. So, you know, I mean, I don't want to say all we've got to do is wait, wait out the change. We can't do that. Uh, but the idea you're going to suddenly change uh, some right-wing guy who, who, for his own, who can't keep himself together without saying that Obama's a socialist, you're not going to do that. That's a deep, 
problem that you can't fix. So all you can do is do what you think is right every day in your own personal life, but also in your community. And these webs of activism, and if a candidate like Obama comes along that you really think is great, you really do have an obligation to get out and do what you can uh, for that person. I actually don't think you have an obligation just to be involved in quote unquote party politics, uh, unless you're interested in it. But I do think you have an obligation to do something for your community every single day, uh, sometimes for four minutes and sometimes I hope for, for four hours. And that will, it, it's, it's going to change. I mean, I'll just leave you with this thought. You know, you guys are all very young, and I'm not so young anymore, and despite the president's kind remarks. Um, so when I was your age, I don't know how old you are, but when I was a freshman in college, I had two African-American roommates. That was very unusual in 1967. When there's the civil rights era, it was the, the, my, the, the spring of that year, Martin Luther King was killed, Bobby Kennedy was killed, the riots destroyed the convention in Chicago. It was a, quite a time to be in the middle of all that. If you had asked us whether 40 years from now we're going to have a black president, all of us would have told you you were nuts. And 40 years later, now you think 40 years is a lot at your age. 40 years in history is a blink of an eye. Think how this country has been transformed. For all the, and this is why I'd say this when I said it to the gay community, but wait a minute now, I know you're all upset because you know we haven't done much about don't ask, don't tell, and all this. Nine years. When Bush came into office, it was one state with equal rights for everybody, including those with different sexual orientation. When he left office, only nine years. Now that's, that's comprehensible for your age group, right? Nine years? All of a sudden now, nine states. The, pa chase, the pa pace of change is incredibly fast in this country. It doesn't ever seem fast when you're 20, and that's a good thing, because we rely on the energy of 20-year-olds who, and their impatience to make things change. We can't do that without that lack of long-term perspective, because you have to have a long-term perspective, you get to be like me, oh, it's all gonna get better, you know. It's gonna get better, because people like you aren't gonna put up with the way it is. But it does get better if you keep at it, and when you stop keeping at it is when it stops getting better, and that you don't wanna do. Thanks.